Okay, Mr. Watson here, and in this video we're going to be having amateurism and how it all started and what the concept of amateurism was at the Olympic Games. So it's taken from a Latin word, amateur, um, and it was kind. This kind of gives sense of what it meant to be an amateur, and that was someone who dedicates themselves to a pursuit. In this case, it would be an Olympic event or sport, um, and. Dedicate yourself not for the money, but for the pure love of that event uh, or sport. Okay. And back then there was one firm rule in the Olympics, and it may seem quite simple. And this rule being athletes who were amateur, amateur athletes were permitted to compete in the games. Professional athletes were not. So meaning if your job was to play sport or involved in sport, you were not permitted to compete. However, if it was your hobby, you were permitted. Okay. Now, while that may seem simple, um, this got criticised quite a lot as the years went on, how the actual rule came about, what was the IOC's actual definition of amateurism, etc, etc. So we're going to unpack that a little bit as we move through the video. And the first thing we're going to look at is this idea of exclusion. Now, back in the 19th century, it was quite common that sport remained a luxury for the middle and upper class, um, with the lower class individuals or athletes routinely excluded from participation, whether that be not being able to afford um, the equipment, the prejudice towards the, the, the lower class um, and quite simply were the lower class um, able to afford or give up time to do sport. Okay, So this idea of exclusion came about and this started to be linked was is this what being an amateur is all about and I'm going to just take a look at a rowing event known as the Henley Regatta. And this put in one rule for this event here, back in that time, and it was, no person shall be considered an amateur oarsman or sculler who is or has been by trade or employment for wages a mechanic, artisan or labourer. Okay, so they went to the extent that not even, okay, we've just gone from that, uh, the firm rule of the Olympics that you shouldn't be playing sport as your profession, but this rowing event in this similar time, obviously 1896, the Olympics was about to come about, the modern, that the sense of an amateur was that even if you use your hands employment, not linked to sport, you're simply a mechanic, then you were classed as not an amateur because you were skilled with your hands. So you could not be considered an amateur oarsman. OK, so it's quite clear there was an attitude towards the working class. OK, um, sport historian Alan Gutman explained that um, amateurism was in fact invented by the Victorian middle and upper class, who we've just given examples on the last screen, and it was to exclude the lower orders from the play of the leisure class. And when the Olympics came about and as we know Baron Pierre de Coubertin he was an aristocrat he's a very rich man as were lots of others involved in that and maybe their original definition of amateurism stemmed from this discrimination towards the lower class um, and it was in fact there to exclude the lower orders from playing so and just another quote here historically classism did rule sports OK, and this is linking to the, the noble concept and they basically didn't want to mingle the higher class with the common masses because many of the elite believed that these plebeians, a term used back then, had no concept of sportsmanship and fair play. So this was the link to the noble concept that there was this attitude and this predetermined opinion that if you were of working class and you worked with your hands you wouldn't understand how to play sport fairly. You know, quite a statement. Okay, so there was this idea of exclusion towards the lower class from the 
middle and upper, and this is what is believed um, um, became criticisms of the Olympics idea of amateurism. Was it time for change then? So at the end of the 19th century, the Olympic Congress felt it was discriminatory to prevent a day labourer from participating in, participating in a field event simply because he made his living by his hands. So they still didn't want professional sports playing. They were still banned. But actually, if you were a labourer, you could start to participate in the Olympics. So things were starting to change. So were we going to redefine it? And in 1892... Um, Amateurism was redefined, um, so that, like I've just said, it only restricted those that profited by playing sports. So you were either being paid for playing, etc. Okay. And again, Sal and Gutman said this: through most of the 20th century, amateurism was defended with the argument that fair play and good sportsmanship are possible only when sports are an athlete's avocation, never his or her vocation. OK, so again, you could only play sport fairly if you were an amateur and you were doing it for your hobby, doing it for the love. If it was your job, you would deem that you don't understand what sportsmanship is. Um, on the other hand, you could say that if it is your job, you might have better understanding of what sportsmanship is. But there we go. So some changes were starting to happen. However, it was still deemed to be elitist. We hadn't fully got rid of the problem. And let's look at why. While the Olympic definition of amateurism was seen as a way to discriminate against the lower orders, it also emphasised that those who did not have personal wealth or leisure would not be able to support themselves with their sport. So if you could only play sport as your hobby, and um, back then the working day was much longer. So, OK, labourers, you can now play sport. However... Were they able to afford to leave work early in order to train? Okay, the answer was no. The wages were low, they worked long hours, and they needed to support their wife and children. So to play sport in, a le in your leisure time, that's catered towards athletes who are rich, i.e. the middle and upper class. Here's a story, and we've talked about this before, Jim Thorpe, and this was a... This was a moment where it upset a lot of people, okay? So Jim Thorpe, he went to the 1912 Olympic Games in Sweden, and we had that quote um, between him and the King, you, sir, are the greatest athlete. Um, Jim Thorpe won two gold medals. However, it came out that he played semi-professional baseball, and, you know, there's different... Amount quoted, but he was earning up to $25 a week um, or even lower. And he had his medal stripped from him because he was playing semi-professional. So this went against the amateurism ideal. He played sport as a profession. And there was this firm rule that you can't do that. You can be a laborer, but you can't do that. But this upset a lot of people because he was only semi-professional. He wasn't earning a lot of money. And he was deemed to be a good, honest man. But anyway, he had his medals stripped from him. He eventually went on to die in poverty. And it wasn't until 30 years after his death, he was his medals were given to his family in a very emotional event. And this had upset a lot of people that was he really at an advantage because he was still working during the day? etc. So this upset a lot um, and it kind of highlighted the path of elitism where athletes had to work a non-sport specific job and they had to still maintain a rigorous training regimen in order to com be competitive because remember one of the Olympic aims and the values was about this supreme mental and physical challenge. So if it was going to be the best among the best in the amateurs you had to train as a full-time pursuit if you were going to be up against the best. But you also had to work and earn a living if you're in the lower class. And not only that, it, the, you had to earn, uh, you had to work a non-sport job. And I just want to link this back to the ancient Olympics, you know, which was used, as many say, as a blueprint for the modern Olympics. But 
you never had to declare what your job was in the ancient Olympics. You know, there was a truce you could gather and, and people would compete. They, of course, they had some strict rules um, and uh, some other discrimination, but it, there was never anything about whether you could do sport as a profession or whether you were a laborer, etc. So what this was highlighting was that it's still continuing the path of elitism. And then we have this idea of broken time payments, and this links to football in the Olympics, okay? Around the 1920, 1924, and then eventually 1928, it became apparent that some countries um, had been receiving these broken time payments. And what these broken time payments were, financial compensation given to athletes for their time missed at work. And Uruguay were involved in this. Some European cities, also Belgium, Norway, but <clears throat> basically what was said was that, well, only the Western can afford to take time off work. Non-Western couldn't afford, like the people, the Uruguayans, they couldn't afford to take time off work. So their government and other people had start giving payments um, for their time missed at work so they could support their family. Now, this caused controversy because this was abusing the Olympic or the amateur ideal. They weren't an amateur because they were being compensated for playing the sport. But the, again, this elitism link was how were their families supposed to survive when they weren't rich? And what ended up happening is um, the IOC got put in a bit of a situation and then it, it became clear that there was a lack of a specific policy. So the IOC started saying, no, that's not right. But then, because Olympic football generated money for the IOC, they couldn't have it removed from the event. So then they're like, no, it is okay, but the athlete can't receive the money, only the wife and children can. And then that got criticised, but how much is the amount? Um, people were still saying that's abusing the amateur ideal. So it just got all confusing. And the IOC didn't stop football. They allowed the broken time payments uh, and then Great Britain withdrew from the Olympics, the 1928. Um, and after it all blew over, the IOC then, be, probably because of Great Britain pulling out of the Olympics, boycotting, if you like, then said, actually, we take it all back. Broken time payments no longer allowed. So they allowed them for a brief moment because they didn't want to lose football from the Olympic Games. And then... They changed the rule back and then again, under the table payments continue to happen. Now, whether you agree with whether broken time payments should have been allowed, they were going against the, the amateur ideal. and Not something that Great Britain should have been complaining about because in their football teams, they were using players from Chelsea. Um, however, at the same time, these people who wanted to compete at the Olympics, they just needed to work to provide for their families and um, so if they had to miss work to pursue their olympic dream they needed money to put food on the table back at home so there's a little bit of controversy there uh again like i just mentioned this was abusing the ideal because football brought money to the ioc so it shows at the time the ioc were thinking about money first and then they made clear they had a lack of policy or lack of a specific policy and they're kind of just making it up as they went along so then what happened is they decided you know what maybe we just allow professionals and we got the dream team 1992 so the rule was made in 88 that all professional athletes are eligible for participation in the olympic game complex and then this started with michael jordan leading the dream team in 92 being barcelona so the reason this was made is that each sport then got its own governing body. So this is where the IFs, the international federations, you had at the local level, like the FA and things like that. They were determining the rules and, and what is permissible in terms of an athlete's compensation. So then there was big money going around. However, this attracted more athletes to the Olympics because they were where they might earn sponsorship or they were allowed to get broken time payments and be compensated for travel, uh, accommodation, etc, etc. So it did, and this, you could argue, Michael Jordan turning up at the Olympics started the spiral of extravagance with the broadcast rights because you can then start charging them more money because 
they're going to be broadcasting Michael Jordan to the world in the biggest sporting televised event. Um, and this is, you know, if you really wanted amateurism at the Olympic Games, you could simply just not televise it. Um, but then the money will will sharp drop. Okay, so the Olympic just took that that um, step to professionalism and athletes were allowed to receive sponsorship, but from private companies, um, not the Olympics themselves. Um, they weren't paying athletes. And then over time, more and more sports were allowing professionals. And uh, the wrestling is the only sport today that is for amateurs only. Even boxing started to make the change in allowing professionals to compete at the Olympics. So that's just a video about how amateurism um, all started and its criticisms that it was for the elite, it was elitist, um, and then how it progressed into a full-time pursuit. And to be honest, as we've talked about in the physiology with periodization, you know, these four-year cycles broken down into nationals, Europeans, yearly cycles, they are needed. You know, if you are going to be going up against Usain Bolt, you can't just be training uh, after work. All right. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, hope it was clear and easy to understand. Okay. Thank you.